Uh, my name is Anne Brady and I'm uh, basically the, the owner and um, creative director of a company called Vermilion Design. Uh, we're based in Dublin and uh, we are currently um, in the book practicing business as well as lots of other aspects of design uh, from exhibitions to, to identity to multimedia to, to a whole manner of things. Um, we recently set up a publishing house um, recent in the sense it's about five years ago now and we're still learning. Um, we set up an indep independent publishing house called Associated Editions and from time to time you will see some of those titles uh, appearing uh, in some of our book design projects. There's two parts to this um, talk that I'd, I'd like to talk to you about today. One is I wanted to really just give you an overview of our um, client list and uh, I'm not talking about the liberators, traitors and defibrillators in that particular uh, point but all of those elements do come into uh, the area which I'm very interested in it, as a book designer, as a practicing book designer which is the subject matter and the variety of clients that actually knock on our door looking for books to be created. The second part of my paper is really around the, um, the ins and outs of one particular project from brief through to <coughs> conception, design, um, the object itself, and then its first edition, its global sales, and then obviously second and third editions, and this is the particular book I'm going to concentrate, which is called The Art of Worship, which was commissioned by the National Gallery of London and St. Martin in the Fields. That's the second part of the job. And if anybody would like to see it at the end, you're all very, very welcome. Our studio is based in Drumcondra, um, which is on the banks of the River Talca. I believe the first colour printer in Ireland was set up in the same location, very close to this uh, site, which is also the, one of the sites of the Battle of Clontarf. Um, we work in an old whisky distillery, uh, which at the height of its powers was the, the most um, innovative um, whisky distillery uh, in the UK and Ireland, where it was producing gallons and gallons of whisky that were being exported all over the world and by 1922 they'd gone out of business. So that's a different story. Our story is such that we basically work as a team of designers. As I say, we have a broad range of uh, design requirements in our studio, and therefore we have industrial designers, multimedia designers, illustrators, book designers, typographers, psychologists, philosophers, and everything in between. <coughs> Some of the people who knock on our door, uh, these are just book design knockers, if there's such a word. Um, we, we, do, we are interestingly commissioned by people from outside of Ireland. I'm not sure if, I think one or two of the other speakers have touched on this point, which I find very interesting, that in maybe the 16th and 17th century, we have British and French publishers looking to Ireland for certain aspects, and we have Irish publishers looking for aspects abroad. Um, so the whole world is a very small place and basically with um, te technology allows for the movement of information, of skills, of knowledge, of craft, of tradition. As bookmakers, you know, we're one of the longest standing book design cultures in the world. You know, we've been creating books for practically almost thousands of years. So really it's not of any surprise that people come here looking for particular skills um, in the creative arts. You know, spines. I thought I just wanted to show a photograph of some spines. I thought you might enjoy that. I like <laughs> spines. <laughs> some of these are our books that we've designed, and some of them are books that we refer to in our design practice. Our design practice is full of, full of things and full of other people's expertise and knowledge. We're constantly absorbing, reabsorbing, thinking about things. Um, there's everything from Miller's books there in terms of antiques and first editions right the way through to a book I think there on the Crusades, which was informing another project we got to work on, which was for Games Workshop, which is a US company specialising in war for teenagers, which is sort of interesting. So a book on Crusades was sort of handy for some background reading on that particular subject. Associated Editions is a small independent publishing house. My husband and I formed it in 2007. We have 14 titles to date. The only thing in common with all of them, probably apart from the fact that I designed them all, is um, that the books that we create are making up for the slight gap um, in publishing in terms of, we specialise in illustrated books. We're very interested in the design as well as the subject matter. And we would argue that it's the subject matter that informs the design of these books. 
hence my title, which is Liberators, Traitors and Defibrillators, because basically it is through the subject matter one designs a book. The book is designed from the inside out. The cover is often the very last thing we actually design, the reason being we've had to read the text, we've had to engage with all the imagery, we've had to engage with the authors, the editors, the original artefacts in many cases, the photographers. We have to engage with the curators, the paper conservators, the costume conservators. I mean, it depends really on how big a team. I think the biggest team I ever worked on in a book in London was for, um, it was a book on the, in royal fashion, it was all of Queen Victoria's clothing from when she was a baby to when she was uh, an elderly lady. And the royal palaces had an entire collection of her costume. It had taken 17 years in some instances for some of these pieces of clothing to be conserved. It was going to be a one-off chance to photograph them. And basically the art direction of that photography alone, just for one photograph, meant that that piece of material was never ever going to be seen by human eyes again in our lifetime. So some of these books do contain precious, precious, precious material that a book gives an opportunity for its, for its first and sometimes its last airing. So it's with that sense of preciousness, preciousness of content, interest in the content, interest in the subject matter, interest in the authors, interest in the people who have spent their life's work um, developing this particular piece of information, be it, be it an e-publication, a piece of printed paper, a website, an exhibition, whatever it happens to be, that content needs to be treated with the appreciation that only the book, it's only putting on display an element of what those people want to communicate. This is just really a cross-section of some of the titles um, that we've looked at just in the last year or two. So I thought you might be interested to see the kind of diverse range of, of, what, uh, of what we've been getting to grips with. I think you're probably wondering where on earth is the defibrillation coming in in the middle of all this. Well, John Sisk and Son, um, who are in the second column um, in the middle there, one, two, three, four rows down, John Sisk and Son approached us to create a commemorative book. And it's quite, it's quite normal for us to be approached to do commemorative books. Not quite sure why, but, but we're often asked to, to work on them. Um, John Sisk and Son are builders for the past 150 years. They probably built any major building on the island of Ireland in that period of time, from cathedrals and churches, Crow Park, Lansdowne Road, maybe the stadium, um, the M50. Um, they also own companies that um, deal with um, the design of medical instruments. So um, their 150 um, anniversary book actually contains everything except the kitchen sink. I don't think there's a kitchen sink in there, but there's definitely defibrillators towards the end. Here's our liberator, the O'Connell. Um, Daniel O'Connell, uh, basically this is just a monograph on O'Connell. The museum who wanted to uh, publish this book on Daniel O'Connell felt that it was only appropriate that they produce a monograph on the man. <coughs> what is actually much more successful about the story of Daniel O'Connell is actually all the guided tours and the spoken stories of Daniel O'Connell and all the oral and oral history and then all these short stories to do with all the people who were buried in Glasnevin. So um, the book in the centre there, Glasnevin, Ireland's Necropolis, has become a much more um, interesting project in terms of uh, people wanting it and desiring it and wanting the stories, um, wanting the nar narrative that's, that's in that book. There's just another, another element of that book. I would argue that really the subject matter will inform the book as object, the book's format, its height, its width, its grid, grid design, the choice of typefaces, the number of pages, the number of colours, the type of print equipment, the choice of paper, possibly even the binding method. We're looking now at an exhibition about a book. Well, an exhibition that we designed about a book was actually for uh, the making of the King James Bible in Cambridge. And when we went to visit the King James Bible and the curatorial and exhibition team, Basically, um, they showed us every book in their library that had any influence on the King James Bible. So they started with a Coptic um, Bible, their, their oldest and earliest Bible. Uh, they showed us a variety of, of different types of Bible, including uh, Gutenberg's 52-line Bible. Um, they showed us things like um, Henry VIII's Bible that he had commissioned, and then they showed us William Tyndall's Bible, and then they showed us the James Bible and then other Bibles. Now, why are a group of curators in Cambridge showing book designers from Dublin all of these magnificent treasures? 
But the reason is that they truly believed that it would inform our ability to design this exhibition properly by showing us the range of material, the original artifacts, getting a sense of scale, getting a sense of material, um, the materials used in the exhibition. It began to inform us, you can't see it here, but we brought elements from all of that world, that wealth of visual uh, information into our into our design. And that's what I would say to you all who are on the commissioning side of design. Designers do actually appreciate and understand and want to know about the visual content of things. It's not just pretty pictures and lots of text lined up in either justified, non-justified, range left or range life <laughs> setting. Books are in a context, a, a book has its, has its place and a place, there are places for books. The digital book, the e-publishing, is very, very exciting. I'm, I'm actually so excited about this as a medium. It's on, on true. You know, we have so much material. We have so much film. We have so much archive of people's voices. There's so much that you cannot get across in a static book. There's so much that gets left out of static books. So really, it's just yet another development. There's a place for things being static, and there's a place for things moving. This is just a diagram of a book. I wanted to intersperse my talk into the ins and outs. I wanted to show you the surface, the surface material and tension of a book designer's life. I also wanted to give you a tiny bit of behind the scenes, because I know for some of you here you were saying you were really interested in the practicing designer's point of view. And the practice of design is actually hard work. There's lots of diagrams, there's lots of drawings, uh, there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of versions of files that if you mix one of those files up, and the wrong file goes to print. It has happened, and it will continue to happen, but you really want to try and avoid it happening if you can. This is just a diagrammatic version of a book I studied in Paris, which is Sophie Gall, Histoire Vue, and it was basically about how she is an artist. This is actually an interpretation of an artistic piece of work. She approaches the book as object as an artistic medium. She doesn't see it as a book the way we would divide a book in terms of it has a story that it's telling. The book, for her, is actually the um, installation of the art. This is another way that we describe books, those of us who design books. They're just a series of numbers and words and letters and PPs and litho and inside 228 pages, 32 pages, quantity 1,000, 2,000, run-ons of 100. I would read this and see this as a book. This to me is a book. It's the description of a book. This is another bit of joy. This is what we would call a schedule for a book, because most books do take between, I don't know, four or five months and maybe 20, 30 months. So it was just to show you the type of thing that we, um, we look at all the time, which is scheduling. Because at the end of the day, you do have somebody turning up who's expecting to see this thing in their hand. So book launches are actually very much part of the reality of our world and always working to that point. This is just an exhibition we did about a book. I wanted to make you smile about this. This book is so treasured, the owners took it apart and framed it and put it on a wall. <laughs> so the book as object has been totally lost. But this has been the most successful visited exhibition this year in the centre of Dublin. So Matisse still um, still uh, going strong as they say. I'm just going to sorry my page isn't fitting um, very well so I'm just going to uh, show you that. I don't know if you can see that properly. Um, this was just another book that just took on a whole life of its own and we ended up producing a stainless steel book, which is an interesting binding. I don't know where um, Philip is, but uh, I thought you'd like to know that we did use some of this technology recently to, uh, to carve a steel, steel cover, um, which saved us from printing uh, or from trying to emboss um, kind of leather or, or paper. Um, facsimile books, looking at old books, looking at reproductions of books, looking at the different types of bindings of books. Um, This was something I just wanted to point out. It was quite a shock to us. We did a little tiny book on a thing called the Kerrybog Pony, which some people believe is a made-up species and has never existed in the first place. Apparently it does. A whole book has been written about it. I'm not sure it's been peer-reviewed yet. <laughs> I think they should, they should try and get this one peer-reviewed if they can. But interestingly, the, the um, critic of this book said, um, like David, they actually began to talk about the book design, which we found quite shocking really because we're not used as book designers for anybody to write about book design and book critiques it's, it's kind of unusual for us uh, usually we're invisible we don't exist and we never we're never involved in projects at all in the first place so um, the Kerry Bog pony is a gentle intelligent creature 
Um, and this book does the brief more than full justice. So it was really interesting that some people link book design to a breed of pony. <laughs> Fascinating, fascinating. Um, books that tend to push out of their medium and, and could be an ideal um, digital publication but ended up being a printed publication. Uh, again, um, there is, we're, we're on this landmark cusp now of, of, of design where do we design um, an e-publication or do we design a static book? Do we do a short, print, di short printed digital run or do we do a much bigger mass consumption run? It's all really, really interesting at the moment in terms of all these decisions that have to be taken about how to, to move forward. Often they can be based from a publishing point of view on commerce, but not always. The Ultramarines was a graphic novel um, that we created, uh, but it actually was inspired by the typography of film graphics. We actually created all the typography for the film graphics for this uh, movie first. It was a kind of blockbuster Games Workshop US movie thing. The reason they knocked on our door was they said, um, hey, you guys know about typography, so you're perfect for our film. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, that's, that's kind of nice. Okay. First time we've ever been asked to do something like that, but hopefully not the last. Um, this was a book that um, I had brought along just to show you the type of thing um, that we get commissioned to do, which is sometimes these books on art. And um, I just wanted to very quickly run through um, one or two slides just to show you what, what, um, what this is all about, basically. It's called, called The Art of Worship. It's fair to say that uh, we started with the cover because they really needed to sell the book about a year and a half in advance of... Um, of actually publishing it, because that's what publishers do. They sell books a long, long time in advance, so the covers have to be fast-tracked, even though it's better for a designer to design the cover last, because by the end of the book design process, the, the designer actually understands the um, subject matter. So it's quite normal to go through a whole variety of designs, some of which you'll show the client, some of which you'll throw away, some of which you'll reject some of which you just won't engage with at all. So you're investigating and exploring. You're looking at uh, image, you're looking at text. Um, and then basically what happens is you, um, you, you sort of finally begin to, to hit on something that might actually be, be worth looking at. Um, very hard to show metallics and special finishes on, um, on screen, but um, we had to make up colors so that the um, people on screen uh, were, were, could, could kind of get their head around the idea that there was actually metallic in use. Um, so that was just showing you some of the phases that you go through uh, as a book designer. This is actually what my computer screen looks like when I'm actually designing a book. So you'll see cover concepts, PDF designs, phase two, phase three, phase four I've opened just to show you. Phase five, PDFs February to March, sample covers, revised JPEGs, phase six, I haven't even opened it, phase seven, phase eight, final artwork. It covers in about seven different um, technical and mechanical uh, versions, some, uh, some for some publishers, because Yale uh, co-published this as well in, in America. But this is, this, is, this is what the book designer sees on screen the whole time. This is the cramped pen mentioned by Colin Kill um, when he was creating his manuscripts. This is the cramped pen, this screen. Here's Titian again. Ha, oh, thank goodness for that. Get away from that other screen. Really, you're looking at content in order to drive and dictate structure, form, content, use of white space, use of space, do text become more predominant? Does the image fight for space? Why would you show Titian in the corner? You know, Titian needs more space than that. Why even create a book of paintings that are three meters wide at this format? Commercial reality is the reason why this particular book has paintings three meter wide put into a space that's about maybe 120 millimeters wide. And our job is to make it look as wonderful and as beautiful and as interesting and as easy to read as possible. There are lots and lots of explorations here on screen to do with italic, use of color, use of typeface, where to put the running heads, where to put the page numbers, where to put the headings, how to hang the paintings off the um, structure and grid of the book all the paintings are different. Um, they all need a certain amount of um, vertical and horizontal axis. 
Um, looking here at different types, should it be grey, should it be black, should it be bold? Um, how do we deal with the internal structures of the dividing chapters? Um, which images to use? How to display something that's quite rogue and random? Nothing to do with any of the rest of the book. How do we deal with um, preliminary matter? How do we deal with imprints? How do we design things when our clients don't give us the text? I've been asked once to design a book without any content. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Not sure how that one works, but um, unfortunately we have to say, look, I think we'll wait for the month and uh, just give us some sample text to it. So really it's just lots of fun. Sometimes you design books where literally you say, okay, how many pages would you like to pay for? And they say we'd like four pages. And you say, but you've given us enough text for 793 pages. So what would you like us to do with that one? So it's quite interesting, and I think somebody mentioned earlier, the collaborative process. It really is a very collaborative process, the whole process of, of book design, and so it should be. Um, you know, things run too long, you go back to the editor, the editor goes back to the author. Uh, lots of conversations happen. Um, you know, you look at the same uh, page 20 times, just in order to make sure that you are actually uh, getting this thing to work. And that at the end of the day, that it's all invisible. The whole idea of all of this is that it's all invisible. As David said earlier, do people actually design books? Is it an invisible process? Well, ultimately, eventually it is, because people don't necessarily notice what's, what's been going on. They look at these paintings. They're not looking at what typeface is straight away. If you're a book designer, you might look, but not if you're an ordinary reader. This is like just showing how it's not working, uh, putting images across, um, across pages. This is, this is an example of what doesn't work. This is an example of how you show what can work and what can't work. Where do you split the image? Do you split it on the fish? Do you split it on the people's faces? Do you split it on the eggs? I deliberately took the text out at this point because I didn't even want um, the editors and curators to even be thinking about the integration of text and image. We just wanted to concentrate on image and how to deal with images. It all got worked out eventually, and uh, all the images and text began to sit very, very well together, and the whole book in, ended up um, quite a, a, an interesting piece of, of design. It was a very technical piece of design because there were about five different voices, uh, there were biblical quotations, there were contemplative pieces, there were captions, there was curatorial comments, and then there was the Bishop of Salisbury's comments throughout. Colour was one of the accented ways in which to denote things. This is to show you how you actually test colour. If you're choosing a coloured ink, how does it work in different percentages of colour? How does it work when it's white on, or sorry, if it's a colour on a white background? How does it work in its colour background with white out? So just to show you the practising background things that go on in design, really, that's all I wanted to show you. And back to this, which is actually what the whole book is, and nobody would have known that we'd gone through that entire journey to get to this point, but that's what happens in the practising book designer's world. So thanks very much.